السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household and all his companions may Allah bless them and bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness Beloved brothers and sisters, yesterday we heard how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was martyred by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, a man who had stabbed him whilst he was leading Salatul Fajr. At the time when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was martyred, he was actually the leader of an area. If we were to put a pencil mark upon it, we would count approximately 35 countries of today. This was the man Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And it was amazing how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had chosen. It is amazing how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had chosen a certain group of people. And inshallah, we will come to see this in a few moments. In order to select the one who would succeed him. But this evening we will be speaking of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu who happens to be the successor of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. This man was the son of Affan. Affan was one of the leaders of Quraysh. He was a great man, well connected in Quraysh. And he was a person who was so powerful. He was related so deeply to those in Quraysh that Uthman ibn Affan was related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his mother and he was related to Abu Sufyan ibn Harb through his father. So his father's cousin was Abu Sufyan and from that he was from the Amawi people, from the Umayyad people. This was Uthman ibn Affan. And from his mother's side he was related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because his mother was a cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and at least a little bit of knowledge of who Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was. As he was born in a very wealthy home, a very noble home, he was a child who was fair in complexion, very good looking. He was loved by Quraysh as he grew up a toddler and a teenager. They loved him so much, the people of Quraysh. They enjoyed his company so much so that some of the people used to actually say, may Allah love you the way Quraysh used to love Uthman. Obviously, we would not say this because for us, the love of Allah is far higher. But this is only to show you how much they loved Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, as he was young. And when he grew up, subhanallah, he was a person who was wealthy, not only because he was born in a wealthy home, but he became a businessman of note. He was very intelligent. He was very intelligent and he had business dealings that were always very profitable. And he became known as one of the wealthiest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But he had certain qualities. You know, if we look today, a wealthy man, very rarely would you find him to be humble and generous. These three qualities to be together in a single person would actually make them worth following. You have a wealthy person who is humble and generous. Sometimes you have someone who's wealthy, but he's not generous. And sometimes you have someone who's wealthy and generous, but very arrogant. But Uthman ibn Affan was not even arrogant, nor was he a person who was stingy or miserly. He used to spend a lot. And this is something that was unique for him. On top of that, he was a very shy person. So shy that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Uthman is a man whom even the angels are shy of. Amazing. Even the angels are shy of him. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later on, if he used to be seated and Abu Bakr used to walk in radiallahu anhu, or Umar used to walk in radiallahu anhu, he was still relaxed as he was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the minute Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu walked in, he would sit down and he would actually in fact sit up and he would mend his clothing and make sure that he was seated in a proper position and posture. This was out of the respect he had for Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Yet he was the father-in-law of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu and we will get to that in a few moments. So this man was wealthy. 
He was a nobleman. He was from Banu Umayyah. His father was the cousin of Abu Sufyan. His mother was the cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was very good looking. He was broad shouldered, which means he was a big man. He was not just a small thin man. He was a big man. He had quite a thick beard. And at the same time, he was loved by Quraysh for his humbleness, humility. He was a very shy and generous person. How did he become a Muslim? Something very interesting. There are several narrations, but all of them confirm that Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu spoke to him. And this was early before the time that Islam had sought uh, meeting in the house of Al Arqam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to meet with some of his companions in the house of Al Arqam ibn Abi Al Arqam radiallahu anhu. Prior to that, Uthman had accepted Islam because Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu spoke to him and told him, Oh Uthman, you are an intelligent man. You are sh a sharp individual. Don't you know that worshipping these idols is wrong? They do not bring for you any goodness. They cannot protect you from any harm and they cannot harm you as well. So don't you realize and understand that this is all wrong? Do you know that there is a prophet in our midst who has called us to worshipping our maker alone? The one who has made us, do you know that he has called us towards goodness? He has asked us to leave all the bad habits that our forefathers have been engrossed in and that we have been ingrained within our culture. And Uthman ibn Affan looked at him and says, who is this prophet? He said, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Now, obviously they were related. They were connected because Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, that was his proper name. So Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib and Uthman ibn Affan's mother, her name was Arwa binti Qurayz. And Qurayz was the daughter of Al Bayda binti Abdul Muttalib, which means they were cousins with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said, you're trying to tell me that as sadiqul Amin is the one who is now saying he's a prophet. as sadiqul Amin was the title of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the truthful, the trustworthy. So Abu Bakr said, yes, indeed. And at that moment, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was passing. So he greeted Uthman ibn Affan and he tells him, Oh Uthman, I am, I am asking you to come forth to worshipping Allah alone. I call you to Islam. I am a messenger of Allah calling you towards worshipping your maker alone. He said, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I bear witness in what you are calling towards and I bear witness that you are a prophet. No speech, nothing else. Immediately, no questions asked, nothing happened. He just said, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and you are indeed a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. As wealthy as he was, as powerful a figure as he was, he was a very influential figure in Quraysh. Although he was slightly younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was influential because he had wealth. Do you know up to this day, anyone who has a lot of wealth, they are quite influential. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. There was a time we used to say, you know, money talks. Have you heard that? Money talks. But I have actually changed that to money screams. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. And may he make us from those who understand and realize. So he then accepted Islam. And he was the first from Banu Hashim, which is the direct clan of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to accept Islam. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so happy, but it made certain people very, very upset. Who became angry? Number one was Al-Hakam ibn Abil As. Abu Jahl became very angry. He said, how can a man from our clan accept Muhammad? And this man is from a noble home. This man is from a noble home, Uthman ibn Affan. How can he accept Muhammad ibn Abdullah as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and quit our ways and our habits? No ways, I'm not going to leave this man. So he started persecuting his own relative and he told him, I am not going to leave you, O Uthman, until you leave Muhammad. And Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu says, I will never ever quit Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not going to quit my deen. Whatever he is calling towards is correct. It is right. Do not let your position, your power, your authority cloud your understanding of what is right and wrong. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, there is an incident that occurred at that particular time. 
and it was very interesting because he married the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that was something that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very happy about because Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's daughter Ruqayya binti Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam she was engaged to the son of Abu Lahab known as Utbah ibn Abi Lahab and Abu Lahab was interested in getting this girl into the home because she was known as a very, very good girl brought up by Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was such a good girl in Quraysh that she was known because of her character, nobility, conduct, chastity and so on. But what happened is Abu Lahab decided to go against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the degree that you know Surat Abu Lahab or Surah to Abi Lahab was revealed. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tabba ma aghna anhu malu wa ma kasab sayasla naran dhat lahab. That surah was sent down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam admonishing Abu Lahab because he had made a statement to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying tabba laka ya Muhammad destruction be upon you O Muhammad is this why you gathered us here to tell us that there is one God and what we are worshiping is wrong so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said yes and indeed the people started scoffing and laughing at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but Allah revealed surat Abi Lahab where Allah says destruction be upon Abu Lahab both of his hands be destroyed so what happened is the little children of Makkah began to read these verses. They were so sweet in, in, in their poetic form. In fact, the Quranic form, so sweet and so easy to memorize that the children who were running in the streets and the gullies of Makkah were busy saying, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin wa tabba. And it infuriated him so much that he told his son to release Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't want you to marry this woman anymore. So they were engaged, but that engagement was broken. And when that happened, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, offering himself, asking for the hand of his daughter in marriage. And Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha was so happy. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was delighted. And he got his daughter Ruqayya married to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhuma. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon both of them. They were so happy as a married couple that the people used to actually give an example of them saying that we have not known a happier couple than Uthman and Ruqayya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all happy in our own marriages. Remember there is a great sacrifice. If you want your marriage to work, there is a sacrifice you need to make. It's not something that will just come like that. You don't just make dua, oh Allah make us happy, make us happy. You spend no time at home. You make no effort to make your marriage work. It's not going to work. But if you make dua to Allah, oh Allah, make us happy and you're making an effort to be happy, to please Allah and so on, then by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the doors will open. So my brothers and sisters, this was the example of Uthman and Ruqayyah binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, at that particular time, because of what Abu Jahl was doing to the two of them, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them permission to migrate to Abyssinia, to Africa. So the first family, the first couple to actually go from Mecca to Abyssinia was Uthman ibn Affan with his wife Ruqayya radiallahu anhuma. They had gone from Mecca to Abyssinia, but they did not last there very long because obviously the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the yearning of Uthman and his wife to be back with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be a part of what was happening in Mecca. So after a short period of time, they came back and then they were from those who made hijrah to Medina Munawwara later on. Now, who were the friends of Uthman ibn Affan? It is important for us to know because with us, we also have friends that we keep and we maintain. So if you would like to be a successful person, your friends need to be people who are equally concerned about success. So who were his main friends? Number one, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. What a powerful friend. This is obviously over and above Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the primary friend of all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But we're talking here of the others. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar al-Farooq radiallahu anhum. These were the friends of Uthman ibn Affan primarily. And then the others, the noble from amongst the Muslimin, from amongst those who had accepted Islam from Quraysh. 
He befriended all of those and he took from them goodness. And he was always so humble, so humble as a human being that nobody would tell how wealthy he was. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. He was also a person who could read and write. So he was not an unlettered person as the norm was at the time, but he was one of the fortunate few who could read and write. And this is why if you recall at the time of the death of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he called Uthman ibn Affan and told him to write because Uthman could write. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. We can read and write. But do we use that ability to actually increase our knowledge of Allah and his messenger and to become closer to Allah? That's a question that I still have to answer. And so do you. And we will always have to answer this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us responsible for the gifts that he has bestowed us with. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, the hero that we are speaking about today, he was a man who spent so much of his wealth that nobody could compete with him quantity wise we spoke about percentage wise percentage wise number one was Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an he gave 100% of what he had but quantity wise the rich man as Uthman ibn Affan let's look at what happened during the battle of Tabuk just prior to the battle of Tabuk the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a message to Mecca and he got up on the member in Medina Munawwara and he asked for donations towards the battle of Tabuk and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum started coming with their various donations. And here comes Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. It is interesting how mention has been made of this in so many narrations. Some of them take the figure, bringing it as high as to a thousand animals that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu brought. 950 camels all at once. Subhanallah. 950 camels and 50 horses. They say, one third of the entire expense of that entire army was provided by one man and his name was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu as humble as he was he did not speak unnecessarily he was a quiet person he was not one of the big lecturers he had few words but he was a humble man so generous he was on top of that he brought 1000 gold coins and placed them in the laps of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uthman ibn affan muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this was his son-in-law his son-in-law and he was so happy that he said ma darra uthman ma fa'ala ba'd al yawm nothing will harm uthman from whatever he does after today he will still have paradise subhanallah so Uthman ibn Affan was told already that you will have paradise no matter what you do. But he was still a very humble person and he continued serving Islam and the Muslims, our hero. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us the, un the unity with these people, inshallah, in the Akhirah. My brothers and sisters, Uthman ibn Affan did not take part, did not take part in the battle of Badr from amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. He was one of those who stayed behind upon the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? One might ask the most important battle was the battle of Badr. Those who took part in the battle of Badr were known as important people. They were known as people of paradise. Why didn't Uthman take part? Well, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Oh Uthman, your wife is not well at all. And that was the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She is not well at all. You take care of your wife. Don't worry. We will go out in the battle of Badr. So Uthman ibn Affan did not go with them. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back from Badr, he found that his daughter had passed away. He found that his daughter had passed away. And Uthman ibn Affan was very, very sad. Not questioning the decree of Allah, but saddened because of the demise of his own wife, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam considered him from amongst those who took part in the battle of Badr and granted him from the spoils and his name was written as being from amongst those who took part in the battle. And on top of that, what we would term a cherry on the cake was that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got him married to another daughter of his known as Ummu Kulthum binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is why Uthman ibn Affan, the only human being that we know of to be married to two daughters of a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No prophet before 
has had both daughters married to the same man, one after the other. Subhanallah, besides Uthman, and this was one of his virtues. He was known as Dhunnurain, a person who owned two of the lights, two nurs. What were these two nurs? Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Umm Kulthum binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu anhumah. So he had both of those as wives. This was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. What a powerful man. What a powerful figure. Then we need to tell you of something else that happened to this man. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. The wealthy businessman, the Sahabi, the very shy person, the man whom even the angels were shy of. When it came to a certain incident of water in Medina Munawwara, where they were being troubled, there was only one well in Medina that would have water throughout the years, throughout the entire year. The other wells used to dry up and sometimes they had no water, sometimes they had water. So this well was known as Bi'ir Ruma, the well owned by a man known as Ruma. According to some narrations, Ruma was the name of the previous owner, but some narrations say it was just the name of the well. So it was called Bi'ir Ruma, not very far from where Masjid Al-Qiblatayn is today. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged the companions that look, we are being harassed by the owner of this well. He is charging so much money to the Muslims in order to take a bucket of water each. He would charge large amounts of money. So he, he is harassing us. Whoever buys this wealth, this well for him is paradise. Whoever buys this well for him is paradise. Here comes Uthman ibn Affan silently, quietly. He went to the owner. And he told him, I want to buy the well. The owner says, I'm not selling the well. He says, okay, let me buy half of it. Look at how sharp a businessman he was. He said, okay, how much are you paying for it? They agreed on an amount. Some people say 20,000 dirhams. Some take it to 100,000. And some say that the man continued to increase until it went to a million. Only Allah knows the correct figure, but it was a large amount of money. So he said, okay, I buy half of it. We remain shareholders. One day we drink, one day you drink. He said, no problem. And the deal was struck, the money was paid. Now what happened is the Muslimin began to drink on the day of Uthman because Uthman made an announcement radiallahu anhu. He says, I have purchased 50% of this well and I have it one day and he has it one day. So you people can drink on my day for free, no money. So people used to come and they used to fill everything they needed and the next day no one was there. So the other man did not make any money anymore. So after some time, he decided to sell the other half as well. He says, no matter what I get, take it. Because obviously this was, uh, you know, a shrewd businessman who has outwitted me in business. He bought half not knowing that, you know what, you're going to lose all your business if this man gives it for free. I don't think they would have believed that someone would actually give this huge business deal out as an endowment for the Muslims as an endowment for the Muslims. Now I want to take you through what happened here. Uthman ibn Affan purchased this well. Now it is known as Bi'ir Uthman. The well of Uthman, the whole well belongs to Uthman. And he made it waqf, meaning endowed it for the Muslims. The surrounding land went with the well. The people now came every day and they drank. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the one who purchased the well for him is paradise. I want to tell you what happened. Today we are sitting in 2014 or 1435 Hijri. Today, there is a huge bank account by the name of Uthman ibn Affan in Saudi Arabia. And there are hotels that are built just near the Masjid al-Nabawi under the name of Uthman ibn Affan. The endowment gives back to the poor Muslims more than 50 million riyals a year. Today, I'm talking about today. Where did it start from? That well. The surrounding land started producing produce because the water was there. And what happened is the dates that came were all for the Muslimin. So the leaders of the Muslims over the years looked after it and made sure it was distributed and it went far and wide. And thereafter, it continued up to the recent times when there is a special ministry known as Ministry of Endowments, which looks after the endowments of the Haramain. And one of them is this endowment of Uthman ibn Affan. Those dates, not only do they go across the globe, 
not only are those dates sold and the money goes back to the coffers of the Muslimin and into that account known as Waqf of Uthman ibn Affan, but with that, they continue generating income generating product, uh, projects and they have hotels and so many other things where the income goes to that particular endowment. Amazing. So up to this day, it is bearing fruit. This was the well of Uthman. And this is why Muhammad says, you buy this for you is paradise. To this day, it is a sadaqatun jariya. It is something that continues. So when you go to Medina Munawwara, you need to know as you go to Masjidul Qiblatain, if it is on your left, on the right side, you will find an area, a beautiful posh area of Medina. Around there, you may ask the people, where is the well of Uthman? And perhaps you might go and see it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. Obviously, the virtue would only be that of understanding the value of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to Medina in order to read salah in al-Masjid al-Nabawi. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. Amin. Another very interesting incident in the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was during the Hudaybiyah, during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. He was the one who was sent in from the outskirts of Mecca to speak to Quraysh. Do you know one of the reasons why? He was very closely related to them. So they wouldn't be able to harm him. He was very closely related to those people, to the leaders of Quraysh. So they sent Uthman. News came that they have killed Uthman. And this is when all the companions had pledged to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that even without weapons, we are going to fight Quraysh if they have killed Uthman ibn Affan. And this was known as Bay'atul Ridwan. This was known as the pledge where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became pleased with those who were more than 1,300 companions who were ready to fight Quraysh because of the blood of Uthman ibn Affan just as well rumor it was just a rumor and it was clarified that he was not martyred another very interesting incident in the life of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an he was the one who extended al-masjid al-nabawi he extended it so much at the time of Umar it was renovated but at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, it was extended a lot. He purchased some of the land nearby and he extended it and he made it up with brick and silver. This was al-Masjid al-Nabawi by Uthman ibn Affan. To this day, you find the door of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an in memory of this great Sahabi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from him and may he use us to follow these footsteps. Uthman ibn Affan at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, Something interesting happened. This is a very touching story. Very touching. There came a year of drought where it was known as Amur Ramada. It was the time of Amirul Mu'minina Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiallahu anhu. The drought was so severe that the people were hungry. They were, they were literally dying of hunger. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu told him, pray to Allah, pray for rain and so on. That day, that day, People had heard that there is a great caravan of Uthman coming from the northern of part of the peninsula and it has in it a lot of food and a lot of uh, provision. And sometime later in the afternoon, a huge caravan consisting of 1000 camels pitched up into Medina Munawwara and it literally stopped at the door of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. A load of camels and the people had come out and they started helping getting the produce down and all the merchandise most of it was actually food stuff and Uthman ibn Affan emerged and the businessmen of Medina Munawwara who had the money they emerged and they said oh Uthman we want to buy from you the people are dying of hunger we want to buy from you from this food we will give you for every dirham that you spent two dirhams which means we give you 100% profit he said no I someone has offered me more so they said, okay, we give you more. He said, no, someone has offered me even more. So they said, okay, we will give you even more. And they continued. He said, sorry, someone has offered me more than whatever you people have offered. They said, it cannot be. We are the business people of Mecca, Medina Munawwara. We know we are the first to come to you. Who else has spoken to you? Nobody would be foolish to give you so much. He said, Allah has promised me that he will multiply it tenfold for me. They looked at him shocked. They said, what do you mean? He said, I make you witness that all these thousand camels you see here 
I have donated them for the Muslimin. They can have them. I don't want a single dirham or dinar. This is between me and Allah. You people may have this. This was Uthman ibn Affan. 1000 camel loads of food and he just donated it just like that. Imagine containers of goods coming in and you say this is for Fuqara al Muslimin. This is for the people who are needy. Whoever needs it, come and take from it. Don't worry. This is yours. This was Uthman ibn Affan, the great hero, the man who spent. Subhanallah. Later on, he took over after Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu as the leader. And this was also something very interesting. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had appointed a group of men who were from amongst the remainder of the ten who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, you are from those who will earn paradise. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was appointed from amongst them and allegiance was pledged for him and they all pledged allegiance to him including Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. He confirmed that Uthman is the leader and everyone confirmed that Uthman is the leader and Uthman ibn Affan, he was such a pious man. At his time, they say the people were good, relations were good. Anyone who did not have, he provided for them. Sometimes with his own personal wealth, not necessarily the coffers of the Muslims. And so many countries had, or so many different regions had now entered into the governorate of the Muslims. From amongst them, parts of Russia and Cyprus, Armenia and North Africa. So more and more areas of people had accepted Islam under the leadership of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. He was a person who had written the Quran or got it written in one dialect. Because at that time, as you know, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu had appointed Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu an to gather the Quran. He gathered it and they gave a copy to Hafsa, who was the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma. So what happened is Uthman ibn Affan, he received a complaint from Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman that I've been to different areas and people are reading the Arabic language in a different dialect. So why don't we sort the problem out? So Uthman ibn Affan appointed Zayd ibn Thabit once again with him a few others and told them get the written parchments from Hafsa binti Umar radiallahu anha and write it down. We want it in one script. So they wrote it in one script. They got hold of all the others and they did away with them. And he sent a copy of this script to all the different parts of the Muslim lands. And he told them, this is now the final version. This is what you will follow. At that time, there were no dots. You know, you have two dots on top of the ta, two under the ya, one in the jim. No dots at all. It was just written. Their Arabic was so powerful, they knew how to read it. So what happened is it cut down the difference of opinion completely regarding the dialects in which the Quran should be read. To this day, we have the Quran that we have in our midst written in what is known as a Rasmul Uthmani, which means the writing that was confirmed by Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. This was one of the great achievements of Uthman ibn Affan. But people become jealous. When we achieve a lot, people become jealous. And there are others who had a bad eye. A man known as Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi, he was actually a Jewish man from Sana'a, from Yemen. And he had started a major, he had started a major issue against Uthman ibn Affan, claiming that Uthman had appointed all his relatives as people who were the leaders of the various lands of the Muslims. Yet, those were appointed by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu before Uthman. And Uthman had not even changed the bulk of them. But this was just a fitna. This was a way of instilling problem because the enemy of Islam saw that now the Muslims are growing. They have huge lands. The East and the West is all now turning to Islam. The best way to destroy the Muslims, internal conflict. So they started creating hatred against Uthman, saying that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was supposed to be the leader. And yet Ali himself says, Uthman is my leader. Subhanallah. And after some time, they developed a great revolt against Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. But from amongst them, there was not a single Sahabi. And there was not a single child of any Sahabi. It was all people who had come later on. They were conned by this huge machine of propaganda that started off by Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi. And what happened as a result, they murdered Uthman ibn Affan after surrounding him 40 days around his own home in Medina Munawwara. This was a powerful man. 
It is reported, and I'm going to end with this, that Uthman ibn Affan, the 40th day of being surrounded by these culprits in his home, they did not allow food or drink into his house, yet he was the one who did so much for the Muslims. They did not allow him to go to the masjid, yet he expanded the masjid. They did not allow him drink from the same well that belonged to him at one stage that he had endowed to the Muslims. So at the 40th day, he slept for a while and he saw a dream. In that dream, he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma, and they told him, why don't you break your fast with us this evening? And on that Friday, he got up, he was fasting. That was the day. The, the opening of the fast, he did not see in this life. He was martyred before that. While his Quran was opened, he was in his house, he was fasting, it was a Friday, and they came in and they brutally murdered him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the internal conflict amongst the Muslims. I would like to say, my brothers and sisters, be careful of those who instill hatred in you for your own brothers and sisters as Muslims. Be careful of them. This is the fitna that started at the time of Uthman ibn Affan. It continues to this day. People talk ill and evil about the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They talk ill and evil about the leaders of the Muslims and the ulama. And amongst us, they instill hatred. The result will only be fitna and further division. May Allah protect us all and grant us a great lesson from the life of this beautiful hero, Uthman ibn Affan. May Allah's peace and blessing be upon him and us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His entire household and all his companions May Allah سبحانه وتعالى Bless them all and may he bless every single one of us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful evening where we are discussing the last two from amongst the 10 who were told that they are from paradise during the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first being Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. He was a man who had accepted Islam at the age of approximately 28. And he was a man who was very good looking, one of the three who was extremely good looking from amongst the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whereby they actually say it was so pleasant to look at him and to talk to him because not only was he good looking, but he had good character and conduct as well from the very beginning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who develop our character and conduct. Sometimes when we speak to a person, we feel that this person is really worth speaking to. And this is what is meant here when we talk of Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. If you look at his name, he was known as Abu Ubaidah, but his first name was actually Amir. And his father's name was Abdullah. So although he was commonly known as Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah, he was actually Amir ibn Abdullah ibn al-Jarrah. That was his name. And he was known as Aminu Hadihi Al Ummah, the trustworthy from amongst my Ummah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had called him Aminu Hadihi Al Ummah, the trustworthy of this Ummah. This does not mean that the others were not trustworthy, but what it does mean is it was one of the credentials that he had, one of the points of virtue of Abu Ubaidah was that he was granted a title by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that none of the others were granted. At the battle of Uhud, 
He did very well. He was one of those who had stayed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tried to defend him to the degree that when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was injured and he had gashes on his cheeks, on his face sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there, was, there were pieces of the weapon that had remained in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's face and Abu Ubaidah was the one who took these little shrapnel pieces out of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's face. It is well known that he was the one who took so much care that whilst he was removing them with his teeth, he actually lost two of his teeth. This is how severe it was. And this is how careful this man was when dealing with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the battle of Badr, just prior to Uhud, what had happened was something that is not very easy to mention. Abu Ubaidah, as he was in the battle, there was a man who really tried to fight him and tackle him. And this man happened to be his father. His own father tried to kill him in the battle of Badr. So Abu Ubaidah tried to avoid him, but the father kept on coming for him. So in defense, he overcame his own father and he did not mean to actually execute his own dad. But in defense, the father lost his life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. One of the stories that is very, very high in terms of the status of this man, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, was that in Medina Munawwara, one of the groups of the Christians had come through to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Najran. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by them saying, please send one of you with us to come back with us to our area in order to teach us and in order to be a judge in whatever disputes we may have and so on. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was at the first part of the morning. He said, come back to me in the evening and I will send with you a man who is strong and he is the trustworthy of my ummah. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, I heard this and I was very interested I was not interested in being sent, but I was interested in being known with these qualities that were made mention of. So I was early for Salat al-Dhuhr and I sat there with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very near him. And then after Salah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked to his right and he looked to his left and he says, I put my neck up so that he could see me. You know that Umar is here, subhanallah. May Allah grant us ease. And then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, where is Abu Ubaidah subhanallah? And then he appointed Abu Ubaidah and he told him, go with these people, be just and fair, teach them goodness. And remember, you are a person who I consider the trustworthy of this ummah. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says that as much as I knew that yes, subhanallah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loves us all. But it was on that day that I learned the credentials of this man, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. He was one of the first who had accepted Islam. It was this group that accepted Islam right at the beginning that made up the 10 who were told that you are from paradise. Imagine one day Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seated and suddenly, suddenly he just said Abu Bakr is from Jannah. Umar, you are from paradise. Uthman, you are from paradise. Ali, you are from paradise. Az-Zubair, you are from paradise. Talha, you are from paradise. And so on. And he continued until the 10 names were mentioned. And subhanallah, Abu Ubaidah was one of the names. So who was instrumental in him accepting Islam? It was none other than Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was a man initially, he went to all his friends and he convinced almost all of them. Those who were close to him, they knew he was an honest, upright man. So he convinced them how many of us would ever be able to speak to the close friends of ours or business associates of ours to convince them to do something right when they are doing something wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. Many of us, when we are cheered along in our wrongdoings, then we consider such a person a friend. So when I'm doing wrong and someone says, well done, well done, he's my friend. That's what we think. Not realizing a true friend is he or she who tells us what we have to hear, who tells us what we need most desperately to hear, even if it means they have to correct us in a way that we feel bad. The fact that they felt for us makes us genuine friends of ours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us recognize 
the few genuine friends that we have that stand by our side correcting us rather than a city full of people who may be hypocritical, who try to come to us to befriend us through, through making us do even more wrong after they know we've done wrong. May Allah protect us all. This was the same man when it came to Saqifah to Bani Sa'idah after the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu met with Sa'd ibn Ubada and the others in Saqifah to Bani Sa'idah to appoint the leader. The first person that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu felt initially that this man would be our leader was Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah. He stretched his hand and he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, stretch your hand. Let me pledge allegiance to you as the successor of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because wallahi, these ears have heard Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on more than one occasion call you the trustworthy of the ummah. So indeed, you will be entrusted with successorship. And Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah immediately turned it down. And he says, I will never ever put myself in front of a man who was asked to lead the prayers during the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu agreed. And they turned to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and they pledged allegiance to him. Take a look today. You have, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a lesson. This man was being offered a post that was not only of spiritual value, but even of political value. And he turned it down. Today, people are fighting for posts that they do not deserve. Do we realize that? This man deserved the post. He turned it down because he was honest. He was definitely a person who was trustworthy. But today, the people who are not even trustworthy and do not deserve a post are busy fighting for it in a way that we lose. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from amongst the losers. Then at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, something unique happened. One of the leaders of the Muslim army was known as Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Inshallah, one of the days we will go through his life as well. A brief of his life. We'll get to know him a bit better. So this Khalid ibn al-Walid was such a powerful warrior that he used to win all the battles. So what happened is, the people started feeling that Khalid ibn al-Walid is very high in rank, raising him higher than he actually was. That was a fear of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. People must not start worshipping the companions. Yes, they must respect them. They must obey instruction. They must understand that the companions are blessed. But that does not mean they render acts of worship to companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So fearing this, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu sent Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah to replace Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. And he wrote him a letter and he sent him. When Abu Ubaidah arrived, he found that Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was busy in a battle. So he decided to wait until the battle was over. It was easy for him to go and say, look, take this letter. Now you are out and I am in. Imagine. But Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah decided, no, that's not how it works. We are not here in order to earn for this world, but rather we are here in order to prepare for the Akhirah, in order to prepare for the life after. This is what Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah used to say. So he waited when the battle was over. He went with utmost humility. He met Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, and he presented him the letter. Khalid ibn al-Walid read the letter and he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, why didn't you give me this letter earlier? As soon as you came, you could have taken the reins and I would have stepped aside. He said, Oh Khalid, I did not want to disturb you. You were very busy. And at the same time, it is not, you know, his famous statement. He says, Ma sultanu dunya nureed, wala lid dunya na'mal, kulluna fillahi ikhwa. He said, it is not the power or the kingdom of this world that we want. Nor do we work in order to build our world. We are all working in order to build the life after death. And we are all brothers for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So amazingly, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu handed over the leadership to this man. And the man got up, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. Now he was the new leader of the army. And he decided to address the people. What did he say? He said, oh my people, this Khalid ibn al-Walid, is such a high ranking companion, such a high ranking companion that I have heard Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Khalidun Saifun min Suyufillah. 
Khalid is indeed a sword from amongst the swords of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for me, I am a simple Muslim from Quraysh. Imagine he's a leader. But because he does not want people to lose the respect of Khalid radiallahu an, he says Khalid is the man. I am just a member of Quraysh following instructions of the Khalifa. And I am just a Muslim. And he says, Wallahi, no matter what color you are, if you are better than me in piety, it is my wish to be in your skin. Which means I am trying my entire life and I will continue trying to be a pious person who is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what will make us better. So in Asham, in the region where he was, up in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, Abu Ubaidah became known as the leader there. He was the head of the Muslim army and he spent a lot of time. One day Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu visited Asham and he decided to go to Abu Ubaidah. He asked his people, where is Abu Ubaidah? They showed him to a little house. He, he knocked on the door, he entered the house of Abu Ubaidah. Or another narration says Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah met him in the masjid and took him home when he asked, let me come to your house. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was a man who always used to be bothered about what those whom he has appointed as rulers and leaders had spent and how much they had involved in this worldly material life. He wanted them to be very transparent. So what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu did, he entered the home of Abu Ubaidah and he noticed no furniture, nothing at all, a simple room, nothing to even light a stove, to light, you know, a stove in order to cook. There were a few provisions on one side and on the other side he had his bedding and that's it. And he had his armor and so on in the room as well. So Abu Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu asks him, Oh Abu Ubaidah, why didn't you build yourself a house like everyone else has? He says, Oh Umar, we are here in this world in order to prepare for the life after. It is not this world that I want. It is the pleasure of Allah that we are in search of. This was the man. So he gave up his business and he gave up whatever else there was. Anything over and above what he needed, he did not have. This was the warrior, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah. So much so that at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, a plague broke out in what we would call today Jordan. That is known as Asham, the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, a plague broke out where a lot of Muslims had died and a lot of members of the army were dying one after the other. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us that if there is a plague in a certain place and you happen to be in it, do not leave. You must be part of those who are quarantined. This is a teaching of Islam. So the plague happened to be taking so many and the news got to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. So he wrote to Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah and he told him, look, I have a need for you very urgently and I want you to come to me as soon as possible. If my letter gets to you in the morning, do not let the evening come without having jumped onto your conveyance and started your journey. And if you get the letter by night, do not let the morning come before you have jumped onto your conveyance and come towards me. I am issuing you this instruction. Now Abu Ubaidah got the instruction and he told the people around him, I've understood what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wants. He wants to take me out of this place where there is a plague so that I can be saved. That's the reason. Otherwise, there's no other job. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has instructed us not to leave a place where there is a plague. So I have to write back to Umar to say that as much as you are the Amir, as much as I have to obey you when you are saying come back, but I've understood what you want. And I want to tell you that the statement of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes above yours. Subhanallah. So he stayed in that area. He was caught in the plague and he passed away. Rahmatullahi alayhi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he got the letter, he began to cry. So the people around him asked him, are you crying? Because Abu Ubaidah has passed away. He said, Abu Ubaidah has not yet passed away, but I know from his letter that very soon, perhaps he too will pass away in the same plague. And then the news came confirming what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was worried about. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu cried so much. He cried so much. And later on, they heard of what happened on the deathbed of this man, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah. A lesson for us all. Something that really confirms his status. He says, 
When Abu Ubaid Amir ibn al-Jarrah was on his deathbed, he called the army and the people who were with, and he told them, I am going to give you some pieces of farewell advice. Listen to them carefully and stick to them and you will always be in goodness if you understand and listen to this advice. Number one, your salah, your prayer. Number two, your zakah, be charitable. So establish your prayer and be charitable. Fast correctly in the month of Ramadan and even your extra fasts. And remember when you are giving charity, give over and above that which is compulsory. Then he said, make sure that if Hajj is compulsory upon you, you fulfill it and ensure that you frequent the house of Allah, even in Umrah. And then he continued, he says, learn to guide one another, advise one another. Do not feel bad when people guide you and when they advise you. And then he continues to say, and this is a powerful part of his statement, be genuine to your leaders and do not cheat your leaders. Those whom Allah has placed in authority over you, be genuine to them. Do not cheat them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. From this, the term he used was an nusuh and nasiha, which would mean if your leaders are going wrong, correct them in a good way. But you don't have to cheat them and you don't have to be unruly. Then he said, Wallahi, if you have been given a thousand years to live, there will come a day when you still will have to die. This is what he says. So think about it. He says the most intelligent from amongst you are those who are most conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most intelligent from amongst you are those who are conscious of the day that they will meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think this advice is for us all. It is valid to this day where he says, brothers and sisters, no matter how long your life is going to be, there will come a day when you have to die, whether it is at the age of 50, 60, 70, 80. And if you really have outlived people, you might live to 90. Most of the companions passed away in their 60s, 70s and 80s. In fact, very few of them reached their 80s. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Yes, yet they were the best of the lot. So this was Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, turned to him. And he was the one who had led Salatul Janazah on this man. And he told the people, we have lost such a great man. Make dua for him. Ask Allah to have mercy on him. One hadith that comes to my mind regarding Abu Ubaidah. He asked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Messenger of Allah, can there be anyone better than us? We have believed in you and we have struggled. We have struggled in your cause, in the cause of Allah and in the path, as you can see. We believed in you and we have struggled. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, yes, there are people who will come after you who will be better than you because they will believe in me without ever having seen me and they too will struggle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those. Those who believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without even having seen him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from amongst the goodness that is mentioned in this beautiful hadith. That was Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, one of the ten. And the last one of the ten, a man whom we do not speak about much, Saeed ibn Zayd. Saeed ibn Zayd ibn, ibn Amr ibn Nufail. He was 20 years old when he accepted Islam. There is an amazing story that I must mention about his father. So our hero here is Saeed ibn Zayd. But his father did not meet the time when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given prophethood. But he had met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prior to prophethood. His father's name was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufail. Listen to this man. He was the, one of the men who never worshipped idols. As he grew up, he got married, he had children. He always questioned what Quraysh was doing. And he went out hunting for the truth. He used to ask the the monks and the various rabbis from amongst the Jews and the Christians about their faith. And he was friends with Waraka bin Nawfal, who was another man who also was searching for something besides what Quraysh was doing. And this man, Zayd ibn Amr, before Islam, he used to go to those who used to bury their daughters alive. And he used to say, don't bury her alive. Give her to me. I'll look after her. I'll spend on her. And he, it is reported that on one occasion, he actually went to one of these graves. He quickly dug it out and took this girl out before she actually died. And he was the one who used to believe that whatever Quraysh was doing was totally wrong. 
So one day he sat on the Kaaba or he sat with his back facing the Kaaba. He stood up in fact, and he was facing the rest of Quraysh in one of their great days of enjoyment. And he told him, Oh Quraysh, look at the sheep that you are slaughtering here in the name of these idols. Yet Allah gave the sheep life. Allah caused the rain to fall. Allah caused the plants to grow and the sheep was eating from it and grew. And now you are sacrificing the sheep in the name of the idols. Don't you have any shame? So they beat him up. Although he was a man who beat him up. Sadly, the father of Umar ibn al-Khattab who was related to him. He was his uncle actually. And his name was al-Khattab ibn Nufail. This man was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufail. And al-Khattab was al-Khattab ibn Nufail. You see where they meet? So he beat him up and he told the youngsters of Mecca, chase this man out of Mecca. Don't ever allow him back in. So the father of Saeed bin Zaid was chased out of Mecca and he went out. He used to come back at night quietly and he used to meet some of these friends like Waraka bin Nawfal and so on. And they used to discuss what Quraysh was doing. But very early in the morning, he used to, he used to go back out of Mecca, fearing being beaten and persecuted. So this man, he once went to Asham to meet some of the monks and some of the rabbis in order to find out more about religion. So one of the rabbis told him, you are from Mecca. There is a messenger who's going to come from Mecca. You better go back to Mecca and meet him. You are upon the, the religion of the prophet Abraham. And he too will be calling towards exactly the same. Because this man made it clear, Zaid ibn Amr, he always used to say, I follow whatever Abraham taught. I worship one God and that's it. I follow Ibrahim and Ismail. This is what he used to say. So the rabbi told him there is a man who will say exactly the same. Go back to Mecca. When you find him, follow him and understand that he is the prophet of Allah truthfully. So this, when this man was coming back into Mecca, sadly, he was killed on the road and on the path. And on his deathbed, he told those around him that look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my maker may not have allowed me to meet this man who is going to come out as a prophet in Mecca. But I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least my son must be from amongst those who follow him. Now this was Saeed bin Zaid, our hero, the son of Zaid ibn Amr. And what happened, Saeed bin Zaid knew about this because he used to discuss this with his family members. Look what Quraysh is doing is wrong. They are worshipping idols, sticks and stones and so on. So the day that Muhammad ibn Abdullah al Hashimi al Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced that he was a prophet of Allah and Saeed bin Zaid found out, he rushed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Abu Bakr al Siddiq radiallahu an. And he immediately declared that he had accepted Islam. And this was right at the beginning, not only him, but his wife, Fatima bint al Khattab, the, the sister of Umar ibn al Khattab the daughter of the same man who used to persecute Saeed bin Zaid's father. They accepted Islam together. So much so that I'm sure we know of the story where Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu a few days later came out to murder Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was his intention. And when he met Nu'aym ibn Abdullah on the path, Nu'aym ibn Abdullah told him, why don't you start with your own family? Look, your nephew and your own sister meaning your sister, your brother-in-law, they have accepted Muhammad. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu rushed. He went to meet this man, Saeed ibn Zaid, one of the 10. And he saw the sister and you know, we spoke about the story a few days ago, how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu beat up his sister and brother-in-law. And then when he saw the blood, he asked for the, the little parchments where the Quran was written on. And he read Surah Taha and he accepted the faith. And he declared his shahada with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the house. This was the man, Saeed ibn Zaid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. He was the one who took part in the battle of... In fact, he did not take part in the battle of Badr. One might ask why? It's a question. Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Saeed ibn Zaid, two from amongst the ten, and they did not take part in the battle of Badr. This was because just prior to Badr, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent them on a mission in order to find something out. So they had not returned except after Badr. 
So they had gone on the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of that, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam considered them from amongst those who took part when he was distributing spoils and he added their names. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless us all. It is reported that in the battle of Yarmouk, this man, Saeed ibn Zaid, he was under Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. And he says, I heard Abu Ubaidah. We were only about 24,000 and the Romans were 120,000. We couldn't even see where they ended. And he says, Abu Ubaidah, one of the men said, I think I'm going to die here. So if I meet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you have a message for him? So Abu Ubaidah said, yes, I have a message for him. Tell him that the Muslims are greeting you and tell him we have found what you promised us to be the truth. Wow, what a statement, Subhanallah. So Saeed ibn Zaid says, when I heard Abu Ubaidah say this, radiallahu anhum jami'an, immediately it made us all very strong and we overcame the Romans. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us ease and goodness. Uh, it is reported that he was from amongst those who took part in the conquest of Asham, the Syrian region, the first that it was, it was conquered. Abu, uh, this uh, Saeed ibn Zaid radiallahu anhu was a part of it. And Abu Ubaidah appointed him as a person who was in charge of Damascus. So he was the first who was in charge of Damascus. But a few days later, he went back to Abu Ubaidah and he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, I don't want to be a leader here anymore. I want to go back and be an ordinary person with the rest of the Muslimin. Subhanallah. This was Saeed ibn Zaid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I want to end with a story in the life of this man, Saeed ibn Zaid. It is reported that later on in his life, a woman went to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam was the leader of Medina. A woman went to him and said, you know, Saeed ibn Zaid has stolen my property. Now that is a very, very big accusation. Saeed ibn Zaid has stolen my property. And rumors started spreading in Medina that Saeed ibn Zaid, a companion of Muhammad, what a powerful man. And one of the 10, he has rumor has it that he has stolen something. Now you and I know that when rumors spread about good people, a lot of the times we would immediately say it's false. In fact, a Muslim should believe immediately that this is false. The minute you hear a rumor about a decent person, you tell yourself it's false. A lot of the times we don't, it doesn't even affect us, but we tend to believe things because we are weak and wallahi, it results in our own downfall. So in this instance, they went to Saeed ibn Zaid and they told him, this is what's happening. The people of Medina are talking. Some of the hypocrites are talking about you. Now he was very sad because obviously he did not want to hurt anyone, but he needed to clarify his name because people would then say, this is a companion of Muhammad sallallahu and look at what he's done. So what happened is he said, Marwan ibn al-Hakam sent to him that look, O oh Saeed, you have a case to answer here. Allahu Akbar. You have a case to answer. Someone has accused you. So he came back, he said, you know what? I have no case to answer. This is my land. And at the same time, I have a dua to be made. And that dua is, oh Allah, if this woman is lying and she intends harm, take away her sight and let her die in the same well that she's accusing me of having stolen. Now this is dangerous because my brothers and sisters, the hadith says, اِتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابِ You should be very fearful of a supplication made against you by someone you have oppressed because there is no barrier between that dua and Allah. So my brothers and sisters, all of us, we should be worried. If you oppress someone and they raise their hands against you, Wallahi, you would be considered dead meat in our language. May Allah protect us. So this is Saeed ibn Zaid. He made a dua. They say in a short while, the rains came. When the rains came, there was a flood in Al-Aqiq. And the flood had taken this woman. She had lost her eyesight and she fell into the same well and died in the well. And that is when everyone said Saeed ibn Zaid was innocent. He did not steal the wealth. You see how his name was cleared. So it had to take something of this nature to clear his name. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from amongst those who spread rumors about the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, we understand the human nature of every individual. We pray for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. He passed away in al Madina al-Munawwara. In fact, in Al-Aqiq, which is in the outskirts of Medina, he was buried in Medina munawwara in the year 51 Hijri. Now we have completed the 10. The 10 
of those who were told you are from paradise. Let me quickly go through their names. We must know these names. We have no excuse. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhum. That's quite easy to remember. Talha and Az Zubair. So Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Az Zubair ibn Al Awam. That would be six and seven. Then we have Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and Abu Ubaida, Amir ibn Al Jarrah. That would be, uh, sorry, uh, that was five and six. This is seven and eight. And the last two, we would have Sa'ad and Sa'id. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Sa'id ibn Zayd. So remember, Sa'ad and Sa'id come together. Talha and Az Zubair would come together. And Abdul Rahman and Abu Ubaida would come together. So if you were to be asked, who are the ten? You would say Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Talha was Zubair, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Abu Ubaida, and Sa'ad and Sa'id. May Allah's peace be upon all of them and may Allah's blessings be upon us as well. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.